Welcome back to the Game Master's Domain. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. Rather than going over a homebrew that I made, I'm going to be going over a guide I put together on how to do something in D&D. In this case, it's one of the first things you ever do, building a character. If you want to support me in making this channel my full-time job, you can follow me on Patreon, and make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to catch all of my other videos. Making a video like this is something I've wanted to do since, well, since I kind of started the channel. But I hesitated to do so since other channels had done it before, and done it really well, like Joecat. But I finally decided to just go ahead and do it, since at least when I started playing D&D 5e back when it first came out, I didn't have a guide like this, I just had a DM who really didn't want to help me out. So like I mentioned, this is going to be a simple guide on character creation in D&D. Going over the basics of what you'll need, and where to find those things, and also where to put them on your character sheet. So, of course, the first thing you're going to need when playing D&D is people to play D&D with, and that can be in person or online through sites like Roll20. Either way, though, you're going to need a few things before you can get started. Mainly a copy of the Player's Handbook, or the PHB, and a character sheet. You can use the PDF on your computer, print them out from D&D's official site, or use a sheet on Roll20. Once you have your preferred version of the sheet, then we can start getting into actually filling it out. Starting up in the top right corner with things like your character's name, EXP, alignment, and all this other stuff. Let's start here though and pick your race. You can also call this a lineage if you like now, but either way, they're found between pages 17 and 42 of the PHB. There are a ton of races in D&D to pick from. You have the generic humans, elves, dwarves, and so on, but also the more exotic things like goliaths, shifters, and tieflings. Your race really isn't something you can change, so make sure you pick something that you like, because these are going to give you the basis for your outward appearance, as well as racial abilities and stat bumps. So while you're looking through the 72 different races that you could be depending on your setting, you're going to see a few different things once you get past the lore. Starting off with ability score increases. These come in a few different ways depending on the race. Humans for instance get a flat plus one to all stats, while something like a half-elf gets a plus two in a predetermined stat, and two plus ones in any stat of your choice. But if the race you chose has sub-races, then you're likely going to have a plus two in one stat, and then you're going to get a different plus one depending on which sub-race you pick, which will better help you fit into whatever role you want for your character. After ability score increases, we're going to have age, which can vary a lot, from the Kenku and the Elves, which can live between like 20 years and almost a thousand years. Age isn't really a big factor in D&D unless you are extremely young or extremely old, so maybe just try not to be a 900 year old elf at the start of a campaign when you're just starting off at level 3. After your age is going to be your size, which for the most part, everyone of a single race are going to be around the same size, and that is going to be medium. However, there are a few races that are small, and I think one that lets you be tiny, but the vast majority are going to be medium. That's the general size that the world is usually built around, and it can make things harder for larger sized characters. The same thing applies to speed here, as most creatures are going to be medium size, most creatures are going to have a movement speed of around 30 feet. The only real exceptions to the whole 30 feet of movement thing are gnomes and halflings with 25, and wood elves with 35. After that you'll find your languages, dark vision if you have it, skills, and small abilities that every member of the race gets, like with elves and their ability to not need sleep. If your race so happens to give you any skills, you can mark those down over on this left side of the character sheet here in this section, and don't worry about the bonuses for now or anything, we will get to that part here soon. After that, if you don't have a sub-race, then you're done with the race section. But if you do, you're going to get one more ability score increase, usually a plus one, and a few extra abilities based on your sub-race. Once you've chosen your race and put all that information in, this is where I like to do the next part. And the order here doesn't really matter a lot, if you'd like you can do this first, or you can wait until after you pick your class, as long as you have a good general idea of what you want your character to be. This next part is going to be doing your stats, which you can find all the information for that on pages 12 through 13 of the PHB. These are going to be found over on the left side of the sheet where you can see these things labeled Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Wisdom, Intelligence, and Charisma, possibly in that order if I got it right. These numbers are very important, 
They're your bread and butter, your, your go-to, everything. Whenever you make a dice roll, one of these numbers is going to affect it in some way, whether it be good or bad. Do you have a 16 in dexterity? If so, then you'll have no problem sneaking around. But if you dumped wisdom down to 8, then you're not really going to have all that much common sense. When it comes to actually putting numbers in these slots here, you have a few different options. You could go with the standard array, a balanced option giving you a 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8 to work with. Point by is also a good one if you really want to focus on certain stats, but the most fun way to do it is really just to roll for them. And there are a lot of different ways to roll, but the normal way is to roll 4d6 and drop the lowest number rolled. So you could say roll two fours and two sixes. I actually just rolled that on roll 20, and I wish I could have rolled for stats that well with my character in the game, but anyway, in that case, you would have a 16, since you dropped one of the 4s, and you're left with 4 plus 6 plus 6 for 16. And if you happen to be playing on roll 20 like I do, you can just type slash r 4d6 d1, and it will automatically drop the lowest die rolled. Some people like to roll in order, so their first roll, no matter what it was, would go into strength, and so on meaning that they usually pick their class after they roll, since if they went with like a sorcerer and they ended up with an 8 in charisma, not much they can do there. But honestly, I just like to put my numbers wherever I want, because I generally have a good idea of what I want my character to do before I even roll for stats. Okay, just one more part before you get to picking your class, and that is choosing your background. These are found on pages 125 through 143 of the PHB. This is what gives you your ideals, bonds, flaws, and so on over here on the right, as well as one or two extra skills, and maybe even a small roleplay ability. You don't have to follow the bonds, flaws, and stuff to a T, they're more like guidelines. Mostly, these are here to help keep you in character, and help you make any decisions that you might be unsure on. You can choose your background from a long list of backgrounds, or just make up your own. I normally like to do a bit of both, taking a base background, and then modifying it to better fit the character and their backstory. Okay, now we can get to the big one, the decision that is going to have the biggest effect on how you play the character. And that is choosing your class. Classes are found on pages 45 through 112 of the PHB. And there are 12 of these to pick from. Well, really there's 13, but since we're only going with the PHB here, there's 12. Your options are the Artificer, Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, and lastly, the Wizard. Your class determines a lot about your character, from how many hit points you get to roll each time you level up, to your saving throws, and how many skills you can learn. All classes give you two saving throws and two skills, unless you're a Rogue, which in that case you get four skills. They usually have a list of between 4 and 6 skills to pick from, so not every person playing a fighter has the same skills. Another very important number is your proficiency bonus, which goes right up here next to your stats. This is more determined by your character's total level and not their class level, so if you were to multi-class into something else, you would still have the same proficiency bonus as someone with the same total level as you. It goes all the way from a plus 2 at the lower levels to a plus 6 once you reach max level. This number gets applied to any role that you are proficient in, whether that be attacks, skills, saving throws, or really anything else that your DM says you're allowed to use it on. So if you happen to be sneaking around and you're proficient in stealth, you get to add both your proficiency bonus and your dexterity modifier to the roll. The same goes for saving throws here. You add the corresponding stat and your proficiency bonus if it applies. These are also a little bit harder to get more of, since normally when you multi-class you get a few things from the other class as well, but in this case you don't get any more saving throws. If you want more of those, you have to get a special feat to do that. Your class also tells you what weapons and armor you're proficient in, as well as your starting gear and wealth, which for some reason is not listed with each class, and is instead found on page 143 with equipment. I am not going to lie, it took me way too long to find the wealth section in the PHB when I first got it. Yes, I know it is right there in the table of contents, I was convinced it was over here in character creation, and I refused to look up there for some reason. Anyway, uh, back on track, 
Any additional things that you're proficient in that aren't skills go down here under those skills. So that can be tools, weapons, armor, or really anything else that isn't a normal skill and isn't pre-listed. Most classes also give you some proficiency in armor, but heavy armor also requires a strength stat on some of the pieces, like full plate. And if you don't have that strength, then you can't benefit from the armor. The armor might look cool, but if you don't have the strength to use it, it might as well be tinfoil. Weapons on the other hand are different, and even if you aren't proficient in them, you can still use them and just not add your proficiency bonus, instead just add in the corresponding stat to whatever type of weapon it is. So if you're just a regular person who's pretty strong, you can still pick up a hammer and deal some damage, but you're never going to hit as hard as someone who's actually trained. Now, arguably one of the most important things that you're choosing your class does for your character is decide their hit die, going from a d6 all the way up to a d12. You'll find the hit die right here underneath your hit points and temporary hit points, and you have a number of them equal to the level in that class. And if you have two different classes, then you have two different types of hit die. Every time you level up, you're going to roll the hit die for the class that you took a level in. So if you have two, like a barbarian and a fighter, and you level up the fighter, you're going to roll a d10. Below that is the temporary hit points, which act kind of like a barrier. They'll help block some damage, but if you're already on the ground bleeding out, it's not going to help since it's not healing. It's just extra health on top of your normal health. Now, down next to your hit die in the bottom right, you're going to see your death saving throws. And you don't need to worry about that until you hit 0 HP, and then you're going to start worrying about it a lot. It's pretty simple though. On your turn, you make a roll. If the roll is 10 or higher, you pass. 3 passes, and you're safe, knocked out at 0 HP. But if you fail 3 of them, well, then you should probably go back to the beginning of this video. But it's not all up to you. Allies can make medicine checks with the same DC of 10 or higher to try and stabilize you on their own. And if an enemy hits you, then you fail a saving throw. Or you can fail two if they're within five feet of you, since it's technically a crit. I would tell you to watch out for that, but uh, if you're bleeding out on the ground, you're not going to be doing much dodging. Okay, so far we've covered most things on the sheet, so let's get into the home stretch. First is this section here in like the bottom middle. This is where your attacks go. Swords, arrows, Eldritch Blasts, spells, whatever you want. They all go here if you plan to attack with them. The names go on the left, their attack modifier or saving throw goes in the middle, and their damage goes on the right. You also don't need to put your spells in the attack section here if you don't want to, since there is an entirely separate page for those spells, but if you don't want to keep flipping back and forth between them, you can just put your favorite ones here. Right under your attacks, you're going to find your inventory. This is just where you mark down everything you own. Whether it be from your person, or if you're keeping a party inventory, you put armor, weapons, rations, money, they all have their spot down here. And then we have this big area over here on the right. This is where you're going to put all of your various features, from dark vision to your other racial features to your class and subclass features. Obviously on paper there is limited space here, but if you're playing on Roll20 you can just have a bunch of drop down menus and extend it into infinity. But if you're not on Roll20, I recommend just putting down the page numbers where you can find those abilities so you can quickly reference it. Okay, so remember a little bit ago when I mentioned a separate page for your spells? This is where you can leave the video or just skip to the ending area if you're playing a martial character, since you won't be using this page at all. This is your spell page. On here, you'll have your spellcasting ability, which depends on your class your spell attack modifier, and your spell saving throw DC. Those are all up on the top here, over top your spells. Your spell saving throw DC is very easy to calculate. It's 8 plus your casting modifier plus your proficiency bonus. The same goes for your spell attack modifier. It's just your proficiency bonus plus your spell casting modifier and then whatever you roll. Most of the page here though is just dedicated to your spells. They're listed from cantrips all the way up to 9th level spells from top left to bottom right. The next page is the bio page for your backstory and stuff. This is also where you can put your physical description, hair color, eye color, height, and so on. But that's all other stuff that isn't really needed for this video. 
The only other thing of note I want to go over really quickly are these little things here between your ideals and bonds and stuff and your features. They're not on all character sheets as far as I can tell, they're just on the Rule 20 one I'm using here, and I love them. I tend to use them to keep track of different levels of spell slots if I'm playing a spellcaster, how many key points I have, different short rest and long rest abilities, and how many of them I have left to use. So if you don't have them, that's unfortunate, I'd recommend keeping your stuff like that on a separate piece of paper, but if you do have them, use them, it will save you time. And uh, I think that is about it. I hope this wasn't confusing or rambly, um, it is my first time doing this sort of video, but I like it, and I think I do want to do some more stuff like this, covering normal D&D stuff instead of just homebrew. If this was helpful though, uh, feel free to leave a comment, because I'd love to hear some more from you guys. But that is going to be it for this guide. If you like this sort of stuff, you can check out my other videos for homebrew monsters, subclasses, and races, or check out the Discord server to join our community. That will do it for our session today, I'll see you next time, and have a wonderful day.